Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, it's a great honor to be welcoming Jim Steinman here today. I'm Eric Sawyer and chair of the mu music department. Um, and uh, uh, just a brief introduction to Jim. When Jim Steinman was a senior here in Amherst in 1969, he wrote and starred in The Dream Engine, a rock epic that was three hours long and performed largely in the nude. <laughs> Needless to say, it attracted attention from a lot of people, including Joseph Papp, founder of the New York Shakespeare Festival, who worked with Mr. Steinman for several years thereafter. 1973 marked the first commercial release of a song Mr. Steinman wrote. He went on to write and arrange all of the songs for the album Bad Out of Hell, which since its 1977 release has sold more than 43 million copies worldwide, making it the second most popular album in history. As, the week, as of the week of April 15th, 2013, Bad Out of Hell was number nine on the UK album charts 35 years later. Its sequel, Bat Out of Hell 2, Back Into Hell, had number one hits in more than two dozen countries. It is safe to say that just about everyone in this room has heard songs that Mr. Steinman has written, arranged, or produced. Not just, I do everything, anything for love, but I won't do that, and Paradise by the Dashboard Light, but also Total Eclipse of the Heart, Holding Out for a Hero, It's All Coming Back to Me Now, among many other memorably dramatic tracks. In addition, our guest wrote the lyrics for Andrew Lloyd Webber's musical, Whistle Down the Wind, which premiered in 1996, and composed the score for Roman Polanski's musical, Tanz der Vampira, now on stage in Berlin for its 15th consecutive year. A true liberal arts grad, Mr. Steinman, has created music influenced by the operas of Wagner, Bronte's Wuthering Heights, Barry's Peter Pan, and Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker. In fact, one of his works in progress is a heavy metal version of the Nutcracker to be directed by Monty Python's Terry Jones and entitled Nuts. <laughs> Mr. Steinman is also creating a stage musical version of Bad Out of Hell to be directed by film, theater, and musical Helmer Kenny Ortega next year. In June 2012, Mr. Steinman was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Now he's here to speak with us. Please give a rock epic welcome to Jim Amerson Jim Steinman. Did everybody uh, oh, get the uh, copies of the uh, articles? Yeah, you, you can just throw them out, <laughs> really. <laughs> just was a way to justify the title of the whole speech. Um, let's see, I should start with uh, saying that full disclosure, in, 19, uh, in 2004, I had a stroke and I lost the ability to speak. So I had to relearn that. And uh, I'm just saying that for the sake of you knowing it. And um, I thought I'd start with this article that's up there. Oh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, actually, I wonder, is I have never seen the Amherst student since then. Is there any articles like this in the Amherst student now? I'm serious, I mean, there were no computers at the time, and that was a big deal to me, the graphics even of the article, the layout. There was I was the arts editor, and that was my first big piece. And uh, it was really a conglomeration of observations on rock and roll and politics. Uh, but I think after I wrote it, I I read Frank Zappa's quote, which was, rock and roll critics are people who can't write, writing about people who can't talk, for people who can't read. <laughs> and I, I sort of figured, I don't want to know if I want to be a part of that. So I decided I should actually write some music. Now, since I didn't know how, that was a drawback. 
So I had to teach myself how to write music, which I did while I was up here. That was the beginning. It wasn't a very good, but it was serviceable and allowed me to do a, the production he mentioned, the Dream Engine, which is a remarkable production, which there are people who are in it that are here now, including the director, Barry Keating, who did a brilliant job and still the best thing I've ever created. I, I'm totally positive of that. And um, the only thing that was weak was the songs because <laughs> I didn't have a fucking clue. <laughs> um, but it was effective. And uh, I think uh, I picked that piece because that exact date, whenever it was, October 1968, when that article was printed, that was when I felt I was born, really. I became the persona that I am. It, was, it required that accomplishment. And it was important to me that I haven't been back to Amherst since then. And the amazing thing about Amherst is that I got so much out of it, I never went to class. <laughs> I was such an asshole. I totally ignored every class. I slept through everything. I mean, there was actually a friend of mine, Dave Eady, whose job it was to come, if they had spaghetti at lunch, he would wake me up at noon so I could get the spaghetti. Um, that's where my, I don't think my love of Italian opera has any connection to that, but I just like the spaghetti. And um, uh, so I think that article was very essential to me um, to write that. And... Uh, What's amazing when you read it through now, I mean, it's it's a bunch of bullshit, really, but it's pretty spectacular bullshit. It's um, um, and it was the first thing, and that's the heart. It's the old quote: "The past is a different place. They do things differently there, and uh, um, everything was different." And that was the such a momentous time of change. Uh, Rock and roll was basically being born in that time, and uh, and politics was tumultuous. The Chicago riots had just happened that previous uh, summer, and they were amazingly effective in affecting every person. In fact, if I look at music now, which I don't, I mostly listen to classical, always have, but when it comes to pop music, to me it's like, Lame. It's just, I think this is what old people are supposed to say always, you know. It's always was better than, and then get off my lawn. Uh, so, but um, the fact is that I do believe that rock and roll was at its greatest between 65 and 73. And we had a new, the new music building here it was brand new, and we would go there like sacraments. Uh, to listen to new albums the day they came out. Mostly the Beatles. I also always remember the White Album and the Beatles listening to that like it was holy. And and actually that's what it was. Albums that came out in those days seemed holy and seemed like sacraments. It was a sacraments to a ceremony. I don't have any idea what it was, but it just formed itself and uh, it was such a flash of new brilliance with every album that it was stunning to live through that and um, uh, that I would l listen to those and opera that's all period uh, I still mostly listen to opera because my two gods in my life were Samuel Beckett as a writer and Richard Wagner as a composer writer and they're my gods. I am so pathetic compared to them, so I have to live with that. But I think that's the point. You have gods that are so much more splendid than you are. And um, I've never achieved anything close to Wagner or Beckett, but I still worship them. And the dream engine as a work, I had very little idea what I was doing because it was an independent study. I had no no work to do in senior year except one project, 
which became the Dream Engine. And the only thing I submitted was that article that you have. Um, I submitted that and said, I figured, what am I going to do with this article? And I said, well, I'll make it a musical. At the time, it seemed like a good idea. And then I had to figure out, how does this fucking thing become a musical? And um, somehow I figured out a way to make it a musical, working with Barry Keating, who's here, who's directed it. Where are you, Barry? Right here. Okay, he's here. <laughs> Barry directed it and played one of the lead roles. I played the lead, and uh, there are a few cast members who are here. And uh, hi, Barbie, <laughs> uh, Lynn. Um, and it was—it's hard to describe how that went. It was such a, a firebolt in the midst of everything, with all the politics going on. The Amherst student was so deadly dull. It was like a little junior New York Times. And it was it was appallingly bad. I mean, everything was layout was never like the one I had for the Dream Engine. Never had that kind of layout, but not to mention no, there had never been a mention of rock and roll or pop music ever. This is in '69, ridiculous. So I don't even think there was an arts editor. So I became the first arts editor and started going berserk and. Uh, I remember the first comment I got from the faculty was, uh, Amherst now has its premier priapic purveyor of pornography. <laughs> I was so proud. I, I, I really was. Uh, after a while, I, I found out what priapic meant. I was even prouder. And, uh, but um, So immediately from the start, it was very polarizing. <laughs> and the faculty it was more than polarizing. They basically despised me. Uh, they knew I despised them, so it was kind of a sycophantic relationship in a strange way. And um, actually, when the the show was such a sensation, uh, it caused huge uh, ovations every night, like twenty minute ovations, and uh, discussion groups. The audience would mingle with the cast afterwards. There was a riot almost one night, and uh, the police were there one night, and t t turned it down, closed it down. And uh, all I was thinking is, this is a box office. This is the way to sell a show. And so I cared so much about commercialism. I used to go in Kirby Theater to the lounge and look at variety and read the grosses of shows. I had no idea what I was reading, but I just liked, the numbers I liked art being identified in the end as numbers that appealed to me, and um, so this piece was so spectacularly revolutionary, politically and uh, theatrically. For uh, to point out how it was so wild theatrically, it's a big musical, about three-hour musical, and it opened with Barry Keating doing a 20-minute monologue as an old man, which is not the usual way to start a musical. But it was spectacular at that time, and uh, I had no idea not to do that. So as Barry likes to say, we had no idea what not to do, so we just did it. And um, the uh, Dream Engine was such a phenomenon that Joseph Papp of the New York Shakespeare Festival came up to see it that Saturday night, and he was fantastic. Uh, he was enthralled. And uh, at the intermission in the dressing room at Kirby, the whole cast was there. Uh, most of us were nude because the second act was nude. And uh, Joseph Papp walks into like 30 kids nude, and uh, which is not the way you usually see Shakespeare being done there. So he knew there was something unusual. But he he actually signed a contract with me at the intermission to have rights to it, and that was at that point I didn't care what happened with school, because uh, there was a big bet going on whether I graduate or not. <laughs> there really was. People were betting like amazing amounts of money to me, like a hundred dollars, and um, so when it came to graduation, when I did graduate, I got a huge standing ovation from about 80% of the people who had bet on me graduating. 
<laughs> I think the other 20% were pissed off. I was just amazed that I graduated. I, it was unexpected, even though it was graduation. But um, <laughs> I remember the last thing I had to do was qualify for gym requirements. Uh, Amherst was so different then. You have no idea. The freshman year in Amherst was the most vicious freshman year in the country. It was notorious. In fact, it ended after that year. The school psychologist, Dr. Copeland, I think it was, he, uh, he decided that it was so destructive. There were so many... I, my basic memory, because I just wandered the hallways because I never studied, I gave up. And um, wandering the hallways at exam time, all I could hear was crying from rooms, people crying. It was like... There was like 12 nervous breakdowns of people who had to leave the college. And it was partly because this it was required to be this kind of a Marine Corps intellectual boot camp. And it was vicious. I mean, I had never taken algebra. And suddenly I'm taking physics first year. And first year physics at Amherst turns out to be the equivalent of third year physics at Harvard. And so I'm completely like reading German I don't know, which I don't know. And uh, <laughs> so it's totally foreign to me, this whole concept. And um, I just pretty much gave up. And um, But when I did graduate, uh, I just, oh, the gym requirement. <laughs> I forgot to mention, I did graduate at the end because I had to meet with the gym uh, professor. And I remember him asking me, don't you have anything I haven't put down? Anything at all? I said, I don't know. I'm not on any teams. And he said, do you run a lot in the summer? I said, no. <laughs> he said, it got to the point where he said, do you toss and turn a lot in your sleep? <laughs> That's a quote. That's an actual quote. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm a very restless sleeper. <laughs> it's, it's exhausting. He wrote that down. I think that's what got me. I'm probably the first one to be in the team for the rest of sleepers. Um, but um, I had nothing else to say. Uh, and I also remember applying for independent study was terrifying because it was only given to a few people. And this is the second year it was ever done. And I had terrible grades. Um, I'd been kicked out of school twice. I got back in simply by my grandmother dying, which she did twice. <laughs> because I got kicked out twice. And I figured, she doesn't give a shit, you know? <laughs> so uh, on the second time she died, I just, you know, got in the second time. But it was pretty awful being thrown out. But I was here every year in the end it just was a question whether I graduate I did and so that was pretty amazing but all I was thinking about was what can I do with dream engine and what can be done with this and I thought back to when I when I applied for independent study it was like judgment at Nuremberg there was a I don't know where this was but there were three people on an elevated platform that really seemed like the Nuremberg trials, and I have no idea why, but they were elevated, which was the scary part. And three people I don't even know, three professors, and they they interrogated me. I gave them the article, which they kind of brushed aside, and I I talked pretty good about it, and I bullshitted my way through it, and uh, they seemed pretty likely about giving me independent study, and then all of a sudden. Out of the blue, one of them says, well, Mr. Simon, we do have to deal with reality. And I thought, I'm fucked. Because <laughs> if there's one subject I really was bad in, it was, that was it. <laughs> I had no connection to reality at all. So I thought, I, I have no way to talk my way out of this. And they, uh, they brought up a huge stack of folders, which is, I guess, reality. <laughs> And uh, um, and they looked at me very sternly and said, we see here that you got a 34 
in physics and a 19 in calculus. How do you explain that? And I said, I was always better in math than science. <laughs> Honest to God, that's what I said. And I think despite themselves, three of them, they all sort of laughed. It was such, it was such a good ad lib. Uh, it was right on the spot. It was totally true. Um, and by the way, it's still on my record, 3419, because I had a wonderful talk with the dean at the second time I was kicked out. Uh, he said, uh, you realize that we don't give less than 30 at Amherst. <laughs> How did I know this was such a discriminatory college? <laughs> <laughs> to stop at 30 is, uh, seems outrageous. And so, this, so on my record it says, the lowest they give is 60, so they wrote 60 asterisk. So I'm kind of like, um, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 Sosa from baseball. Uh, and uh, I have an asterisk. Uh, you know. I didn't take steroids, but I took a lot of acid. <laughs> uh, that's another funny thing. I, I had never smoked marijuana in my whole life while I was here, but I took so much acid and mescaline, which was incredibly good, by the way. I thought, I, I thought it should be required. I, I still feel that. I think that drugs should be required with supervision <laughs> and discounts. Uh, but um, So I did get independent study, and uh, I am totally convinced it was because of that ad lib uh, comment. And... Uh, the comment was, keep us informed about how you're going to transform this article into a musical. And um, I never sent them a fucking thing. <laughs> so they hated that. And uh, the people who graded me at the end, this phenomenal piece, Joseph Papp and all that, and I get a D-minus grade, uh, which is made of one professor, Donald White, a professor of German, no less, um, gave me an F. Uh, the other two gave me D minuses, so it averaged out. Uh, gave me Ds, so it averaged out to D minus. That was my grade. Barry got an A. <laughs> I don't know who you had to fuck to get an A, but um, yeah, I guess so. Because. Uh, you did a great job directing it and in it, but I, I created the whole thing too when I was in it, but I got an F. Uh, I could care less though because I had a career. I I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to do rock and roll and theater, and I never knew that till then. I didn't have a concept of what it was until I did Dream Engine, and so for that alone, Amherst was the most magnificent treatment I received, you know, it was like the equivalent of 10 years of therapy, I suppose, if therapy allowed you to get up at noon and eat spaghetti, <laughs> which I don't think it does, but I, uh, I'm sure there is some school that allows that. But uh, um, So uh, the time then was spent, Barry knows this well, the two of us trying to do Dream Engine and Pap's idea was a brilliant idea. He wanted to take the whole cast and move them all to the Delacorte Theater at Central Park in New York and do it just as it was in, here at Amherst. And had that happened, it would have been the most amazing, sensational thing ever. I really believe that. Um, hair had just happened off-Broadway, and he saw this as like 10 steps beyond hair, and it really was. Uh, but... Unfortunately, the Delacorte never got approved by anybody because it was always Shakespeare. But this time, it was the first new work they were going to have at the Delacorte. So I had to give the script to the uh, Pap, and he had to give the script to the city council. And John Lindsay was running for mayor in 1970, and there was no way they were going to allow this to be done. They thought it was incredibly sexually raunchy, explicit, obnoxious. It was all of that, but it was really fun, too. And um, so um, it just fell apart. And that was such a shame because it would have been thrilling. And I think 
eighty percent of the cast would have actually come. They were actually hanging around for that, but it just didn't happen. And then a long series of stories of trying to do it with Pap in other places. He was wonderful to me. I mean, he was a wonderful man. And um we just never could get it done really. It just part of it was it was so hard to transfer the zeitgeist, the aura up here where everything was so combustible down to New York City and keep that same thrill. It just never happened. So I had to learn how to just write music and uh, keep writing theater, which I did. And writing music was the hardest part. <coughs> Excuse me, because I hadn't done that. Oh, like magic. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's vodka. Um, I remember thinking to myself, what do I want a song to be? And, you know, I had no idea. I, I hit, I guess, but I had no idea what that meant. And um, I listened to all the Motown. I knew I had no idea how, what the chords were. I I knew what Dylan's chords were, but I couldn't write the lyrics that well. And I was stuck, pretty much. I finally realized that, to me, a great song should be an erection of the heart. And that became my mantra to myself, an erection of the heart. I thought a great song should be that, a great place should be that. Beckett created erections of the heart. Wagner created erections of the heart. And I hope that I did. The problem was my songs were very long, which resulted in, I think they needed the same warning as Cialis has. Uh, but that's okay too. See, Alice is fine. So I, I, I learned to write music that way. I lyrics first and music after that, and I just wrote what I wanted to write. And um, I met Meatloaf auditioning for the first show I did at the Public Theater, <coughs> and uh, I should take these off. I just realized I had them on. No. Oh, my God. It's in color. Um, is all the world like this? <laughs> um, but um, right. one thing I... If, there's, if anyone wants to go into show business, the best thing I can do is simply quote someone else. William Goldman is a great writer who wrote a book called The Season, about a Broadway season. And the, he has an amazing chapter. The, as I remember, chapter 13 ends with a long paragraph saying, Above all else, if you remember nothing else, you must never forget this. This is the one thing you have to know every minute of your life and never, ever, ever ignore this. And that was the end of the chapter. And and you turn the page, and there's chapter 14, and I've never seen this before. The font, which is a normal font, changed to the biggest font I've ever seen in a book. Two pages, and all it said is, nobody knows anything. That was chapter 14. And that was the one thing to not to forget, and I've learned that totally true. If you can remember that nobody knows anything, you're in good shape because that's really the hardest thing to keep in mind and one of the most destructive is that you think people do know something and they don't I, that's all I can say as advice is just remember nobody does know anything and um, so I started writing these songs the first one was the album Battle of Hell and it was considered a complete joke um, it was seven songs. A lot of them were 10 minutes long. Um, there was one I wrote to be a single, as they said. Um, they said, can't you write something short? So I wrote something. It was still five minutes, but it was shorter than anything else. And that became the only one that got airplay, except for the FM stations. This was also the birth of FM radio at that time, which is such a 
antiquated thing to talk about now. I, it's like I'm talking about the old Roaring Twenties or something. But um, uh, you couldn't get airplay of long songs, except on a few stations. And there were two very long songs, Battle of Hell and Paradise by the Dashboard Light, that were about 10 minutes apiece. And one station in New York, WNEW, played them. They were the only station that did that. And one station in Cleveland played them, the only two in the country, which was pretty horrifying. I was really, I would have the radio on for hours. Just There's nothing more exciting than hearing a song on the radio. It really is the truth. In a car, especially. But um, I didn't have a car, so... <laughs> <laughs> I was just listening to the radio, and uh, I, eventually I met the uh, program director, a guy named Scott Muni, and I, I went up to him and I said, thank you so much for playing those songs. And he said, and this is exactly what he said to me. He said, well, you know what I love about those songs? They're so long, I can put them on, go into the bathroom, take a long dump, <laughs> and come back, and they're still playing. That's why I love them. <laughs> I thought, well, I guess if this is music criticism, this is a great review. <laughs> I mean, music to take a dump by, you know. Uh, it's functional, at least. Um, but having grown up with Wagner, I thought these songs were short, you know. I was used to five-hour, six-hour things. I still am. And... Um, I think I didn't really master songwriting until I wrote in 1981 a song called Total Eclipse of the Heart, which really became probably my best known song. And i um, very proud of it. I have no idea how I did it. I have, I have no idea how I did any songs. I know nothing about musical theory. I'm always amazed because there's a YouTube of a guy analyzing Total Eclipse of the Heart musically very very brilliantly about 25 minute video i'm watching this and i'm thinking did i fucking do this <laughs> amazing there must be something good in somewhere in me um but uh, it was a very impressive you know about chordal choral modulations and keys and things i had never thought about i was so busy just thinking about lyrics and um which is another good piece of advice. I think if you're going into music, everyone always asks, what do you do? To me, the best thing is always write lyrics first. Um, I just think it lends itself to a better song because if you write music first, you tend to, the lyrics tend to be diluted because you're working with the music. But it's different for everyone, so that's sort of take it or leave it. But... Um, I did feel lyrics were the key. And um, uh, I didn't work with Meatloaf again on a record for 16 years, which to me was the right time between records. Um, I just had a different point of view. So that's when I did the second Battle of Hell album that had I Do Anything for Love But I Won't Do That, which to this day amazes me that everybody I meet says, what was that? What is that that he won't do? And I thought it was so obvious when I wrote it. But it's this great trick, uh, uh, op not an optical illusion, I guess an audio illusion or a mental illusion. The words somehow trick the listener into not knowing what it is, even though it's spelled out. So I won't get into what it is, because it's much better if it's not, it's a mystery. But um, uh, the best comment came from Meatloaf's manager at the time and said, we're going to be huge with this song. I said, really? This is going to be a hit song? He said, the title is number one. And that was a great comment. And and it did become a number one song, and that was exciting too. That was my first number one after Eclipse. Um, Eclipse was cool because at that time, to rest on some laurels, <laughs> uh, I need some laurels to rest on, uh, uh, I had two songs that were number one and two, for five weeks in Billboard 
uh, Total Eclipse was number one, and Making Love Had Nothing at All with Air Supply was number two for five weeks. And uh, I was wanted Total Eclipse to be the bigger one anyway. But um, what was amazing is no one had ever had one and two together, individual, in history. And it still hasn't happened. Prince had number one and two, but he didn't sing them. I think the Bangles sang one. Um, and the Bee Gees had one and two, but they didn't produce them. I had written and produced and arranged and everything on the records. And that was the first time that ever happened. And still, I think, to this day, is the only time. So that was kind of exciting. And um, basically, I kept wanting to do theater and film. And uh, another thing I learned is you can't mix these things. Um, if you want to do film, which I really wanted to do, um, you have to live in Los Angeles, so you have to be there a lot. You have to follow up on everything. And uh, I just kept coming back to music, and that was a mistake in that sense because... If you jump around, you can keep it going. You have to. LA is, and television and film is so much based on uh, networking and pushing things forward, and it's really promoting what your work is. And I couldn't do that, so eventually, it just became theater and music. And um, the theater, that my greatest experience ever was working with Roman Polanski on Tons de Vampire which was done in Vienna and then moved from Vienna where it ran for three years to Germany where it's run for ever, it seems like, you know. All I know is Hitler was gone, so it was after that, but um, I, it was an amazing experience. And every, uh, Stevie Drinkoff, who co-produces with me, is here, and my engineer is a brilliant guy, and he, every day we go to see the show and he, whispered to me, it's still in German. I said, yeah. Yeah, it still is in German. <laughs> and I had no idea. I mean, I sort of knew what they were saying, but I never really heard it right. And when they did it in English, they fucked it up so badly that I won't even think of it as being in existence, really. It was so pathetic. Which is another lesson about nobody knows anything was the case. And... um but uh, it was enough to do with the one in Germany, which is still there in uh, Berlin after all these years. And um, and then I did uh, Whistle on the Wind with Andrew Lloyd Webber, which was, what was cool about this is I did the lyrics for that. He did the music, of course. And Tans, I did the mu music, but not the lyrics, which are in German. Uh, I wrote some in English that would change to German, but mostly I did the music. So I like that I did one show music, one show lyrics. I like that kind of versatility. And um, actually, this seems like a good time, Barry, for you. Barry can do a short excerpt from the opening of the Dream Engine, which opened with this speech by an old, ancient historian. I'm the only person who can still play the same part they played 40 years ago. Yeah. So you have to be, imagine me even more old and wizened than I am. I'm kind of, uh, Jim wrote this, uh, I was the character guy at school, so he kind of put a conglomeration of like uh, um, Professor Erwin Corey, uh, Ludwig von Drake, and... Uh, they were real professors here, weren't they? <laughs> I remember that in my Imers. So, uh, yeah, and this is the beginning of our, our musical. Ladies and gentlemen, I am an historian. Ketchup or blood? Yes. No. Yes. Ketchup or blood, then, which is which? Yes. No. Yes. Ketchup or blood, does it matter? They both disgust me. Ketchup or blood, does it matter? Ketchup or blood, I asked you a question. Ketchup or blood? Ketchup or blood? Ketchup or blood, does it matter? We pour one of our meats to make our meals more comfortable. 
We pour the other on our flesh to make our deaths more colorful, to make our wars more colorful, to make our stockyards shine brighter with red, to make our burial grounds run richer with red. Let the food be seasoned with ketchup, let the stockyards be seasoned with blood, and let us all take it wherever we can get it. Yes. No. Yes. We pour one on our meats to make our meals more colorful, colorful the other on our flesh to make our wars more colorful, to make our slaughter more colorful for the movies. And yes, we do have colorful movies, yes. find them immeasurably more entertaining than the theater, don't you? You do? Then get out! <laughs> Ketchup and blood, we enjoy them both. Ketchup and blood, we love our movies. Ketchup and blood, we love our lives. Ketchup and blood, we love our dramas. Ketchup and blood, we love our meat. Well, don't we? Don't we love our meat now? Don't we? All together now. Look at me all together now. Yes, 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 we love our meat. So why do we smother it in ketchup? Why do we drown it in blood? Yes, no, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I am an historian. I have to keep reminding myself something that hideous, which I forget. I deal in life, life. So little to do and so much time to do it in. I think I'm gonna puke. <coughs> Shut up! <laughs> Where was I? Oh, yes, the young. The young, the fine young boys, and the fine young girls. First, the girls. The girls who submerge themselves night after night in long, strenuous swims beneath the hard, stiff undertow of young boys' waves. I don't give a damn if they drown or not. Well, how long do you think it'll last? How long before you find yourself sweating from one filthy supermarket to the next, looking with horror at your own flabby, irrigated flesh. I can see you now. I can see you wobbling down the street. Your fat tits erupting in front of you. Your fat, hideous tits, bouncing hysterically, like two middle-aged cheerleaders trying desperately but hopelessly to arouse enthusiasm for the tired, antique body that follows far behind. I use the word body loosely. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. And the fine young boys, the blue-eyed boys, how proud they are, hurtling themselves through space in the middle of a clear green field, legs tightly wrapped around a pliant apple tree. How long do you think it'll last? How long before your shattered remains are found in some enemy swamp? Somewhere far off in some enemy swamp land and sent home to mother on a tin pan coffin with your name inscribed on your ass and the lid open wide. How long before that lovely head of yours explodes in a blaze of blonde chaos after just one golden overdose more than you can stand? <laughs> you can't escape. The battlefield of eternal undeclared wars is unbounded and endless. There are no limits there. There never will be. And terrified young men, just like yourselves, will continue to lob one another's skulls across the wings of strange birds that are burning themselves alive, just like you are. There's no way out. And after that, how soon before you find yourself trapped in a business suit? A prisoner in your own nightly bath with pink soap balls for eyes and nothing to see and no reason to try. The perfect American marriage, perhaps. The vegetable husband and his vegetarian wife. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> well, I could go on, but I won't. Tonight is a festive occasion, and I, I, I let myself get carried away. The fine young boys, the blue-eyed boys. Fools, I warn you, but you never listen. Fools, all of you! <laughs> I suppose I should be proud. Don't let it fool you, shitholes. <laughs> I admit it, there is nowhere else. I'll admit it. You see how much I hate you? Well, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, 
tonight's history. Perfect. Uh, it seems to me every musical should open like that. <laughs> a, a senior in college wrote that. <laughs> yeah. And the first song I wrote, actually, was Who Needs the Young? It was during the riots in uh, Chicago. I found it easier to write from the villain's point of view, which was very helpful because it showed me how to write character songs. So I wrote a song, Hatred of Young, at the age of 19. <laughs> And uh, it was a great exercise when I look back on it. Um, but that was an amazing, that was just an excerpt of that speech. It was 20 minutes, but it was pretty amazing when he did it. Very good, Barry. <laughs> just such a wild way to start a musical. <laughs> I just can't believe this. As we often say, the stuff we did, we had no idea we couldn't do this. So that's why we did it. Um, and the opening number was a really long, spectacular opening number. So it's a pretty wild show um, and deserved the response it got. I mean, that's why I'm proudest of it. Better than anything I've ever done in my life is at Amherst, my senior year. It's an amazing thing to look back on. But now, get off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I sort of revel in being an old geezer now. You know, what the fuck? <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, questions. Oh, I thought you had a question. <laughs> uh, let's do questions. Anyone have questions? Yes. Actually, that's actually one of the only things I totally eat all the time. I never got over that. <laughs> Since I was a little kid, actually. Any other questions? <laughs> that was a challenging one. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's like it's like a rider working with a bull at a rodeo. <laughs> and I don't have to tell you who's the bull. And a little less behaved than the bull. That was what it was like me working with Meatloaf. <laughs> Actually, the time I met him, he was not at all like he is now. I became, he was directed to become Meatloaf, a character. He was an a farm kid who really came in as a farm kid, uh, just all shocks and well, I don't know, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, and he, once I heard his voice, I just thought he's a Helden tenor. He's a Wagnerian Helden tenor, which means heroic tenor. And uh, I thought he could be great. And everyone else was disgusted. You know, he's big and fat. What do you want? And but we, I got the writer, Michael Weller, to write a part for him in that show that Barry was in, too. And uh, he was on stage with Beatloaf. What would you say Beatloaf was like then? He was a mesmerizing guy. He was like a force of nature. Yeah. He had a cameo part, but um, I never liked him. Yeah, I wrote a great song for him. And I remember he was so scared of everything. He kept saying before the first show, he said, Jimmy, I can't go out there. I can't go out there. There's two people out there. I can't go out there. I said, well, this is going to be tough, me. Um, there have got to be people out there. But uh, I said, I, all I can tell you is they will stand up and cheer after your song. No one did going to do that in the middle of a show. There's only 60 people in this, this little tiny place. I said, well, they're going to do it. I had no idea if they were going to do it, but I had to say it. So he sang the song, and... I, honestly, 60 people stood up and cheered. And I knew I was right. I knew this was a great talent. It took a lot of work. We rehearsed every day for like two years. I had to teach him all different voices. And I taught him even the mannerisms. And what happened is he became the character of Meatloaf. It's a sort of fascinating. Uh, um, he became impossible, so to speak. Uh, with the help of a lot of cocaine. and uh, uh, But it, that's why it was 16 years later that I did another album with him where I had to teach him how to sing again. But still, it was... I still... I was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame and Meatloaf did the induction. It was kind of wonderful to have the full circle. 
And um, it was kind of nice being inducted. It wasn't as painful as I thought, the induction. <laughs> induction seems more painful than it actually is. Any other questions? Any? Uh, yeah? Who? Uh, you know, I. Yeah. Yeah, I remember him now. Marshall Bloom. Yeah. But I was political. You weren't. You weren't then. But I, I was doing marching with. I, I went on a great march with Allen Ginsberg in New York. Was beaten up, beaten up twice by the police. Anti-war movement. You know, I tell you, this is the most, the biggest regret I have is that they abolished the draft, N not for political reasons, but for aesthetic reasons. It totally made rock and roll what it was. It was the primary force. Is you can't believe what it was like knowing you might be killed every day, even at Amherst. It was supposed to have student deferments, but they were taking 23 people out of Amherst. And my hometown, I had no choice. I mean, I was definitely going. And um, that kind of urgency and desperation and anger fueled so much power in music. And the whole culture sort of was exploding. Um, the drugs, the, the music, the social mores and... It was an astonishing time, brilliant time. Um, but the draft was the reason. And what music lacks now, besides Steve Jobs coming up with iTunes, which, you know, I can't knock it, but it destroyed my profession of being a producer. Really, there are no producers anymore. There are no albums. It's all singles because of iTunes. But, and digital, I hate digital. I mean... I can't even describe to people if all I can say is if you never heard analog records, you have no idea what things should sound like if you grow up with CDs or DVDs. It was all about analog and the power of analog. So the draft and Steve Jobs, <laughs> they both died since then, but um, they, they really were the forces that control things. Uh, and I miss so much the music of those days. Uh, not just the Beatles, but I would I would cry hysterically listening to Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys. I mean, just sob and sob. So, the same way with Beckett. I was very fortunate at the age of 8, 9, and 10, my parents would take me to off-Broadway shows. So I saw Albie, Edward Albee's One Axe, American Dream, uh, Zoo Story, Death of Bessie Smith, uh, Beckett, I saw Endgame, uh, Crap's Last Tape, Happy Days, Incredible Play, Happy Days. If you haven't read Beckett, read Beckett. He's the only playwright you have to read, that's what I would say. A genius, and um, so much better than I can even dream of. But, uh, I mean, miraculous. And the fact that he wrote everything in French, and he's Irish, to write in French and then translate back, I mean, that's awesome to me. Of course, that always reminds me. I ended up for two years wanting to be a record producer primarily because I thought it was an easy gig and you could make a lot of money, but it was I hated it. And uh, my first group I did was Def Leppard. And we were probably now like such antiquated people. But at the time, they were the hottest rock and roll group. And I had to go over to Ireland to meet with them because they were expatriates because they couldn't pay the taxes in England. And uh, the weirdest experience of my life was meeting with Def Leppard. I spent months with them. But they, um, the thing I really treasured was at one point we all had a conference and the lead singer said, look, we apologize that you had to come to Dublin Ireland, but we we can't be in England, so I'm sorry about this. I said, sorry? Are you kidding? Ireland, Dublin, this is the home of Singe, O'Casey, uh, George Bernard Shaw, um, who are the others? Yates, Yates. 
James Joyce? Yeah, I named everyone. <laughs> uh, I said, just being here is amazing. And his comment was, well, we don't haven't really played with these local musicians yet. <laughs> so I figured I wouldn't pursue that train of thought, but it was the same. And the drummer whispered to me one day, I really want to be in this record. And I said, well, you're the drummer, right? Yeah, but I really want to be in this record. Well, there's something more to this that I'm missing. <laughs> it turned out, previous two records, he had never touched a drum. It was all done by the producer, Mutt Lang, who ended up married to Shania Twain. Very strange way to end up. <laughs> and, uh, but he, he was doing then things like The Cars and Def Leppard and, uh, he's a great producer, but insane, totally insane. And um, he had never allowed real drums. He was one of the first to only use drum machines, but not like dance music, not like drum machines like I used in Holding Out for a Hero. He used them to simulate real drums, but he wouldn't let the drummer play. And the drummer was upset about that. And so this poor guy, the drummer, my favorite guy in the band, he... um. This group had no idea how much money they had. They had millions and millions of dollars, but they had no idea. They just knew how many cars they had. That's how they judged things. You know, I have nine cars, okay. And uh, that weekend, he went over to, um, we were in Holland at that point recording, and um, he went over to Sweden for some reason and bought an incredible Corvette a new Corvette that was all black and just gorgeous. And he drove it onto the uh, recording studio a lot to show everyone. I said, that's an amazing car. It's like a death car. It looks like a car of death. And I was kidding, but it was like one month later that New Year's Eve, he got in a car accident and lost his leg. And I, his arm, his arm. I knew it was one of those things. <laughs> Uh, details <laughs> he lost his arm and so I called him up the uh, tour manager I couldn't talk to him but I said how is he and he says the tour manager said well not good uh, they finally had to amputate I said so he has no arm he said yeah luckily it won't affect the drumming <laughs> that was an eye opener <laughs> and he still plays with the one hand I mean, the one arm, and uh, the rest is all triggered, and uh, something, I don't know what the moral of that is, but that's uh, <laughs> just a good story. Any other questions? Yeah. How, how did you guys get Rizzuto to... Uh, oh, <laughs> that's a good story. Um, that was my idea to get Phil Rizzuto. Both Meatloaf and I were fanatic Yankee fans, and... Uh, when it came time for the sex scene, I figured it had to be, uh, couldn't be actual sex, so it would have to be baseball play by play, first base, second base, third base home. And I thought it has to be Phil Rizzuto doing it. So Phil Rizzuto's manager was Art Shamsky of the Mets, <coughs> outfitter for the Mets. Excuse me. <coughs> and Art Chamsky got him the worst fucking deal. Like a thousand dollars, period. He could have gotten him a point or a half point. He would have made millions, but a thousand bucks. And he wasn't there. Todd Rundgren, who produced it, forgot to bring the tapes when we recorded Rizzuto. So we had to do it wild with no music. It was hilarious because I had to direct Rizzuto who started off terribly, he started off by going, it was all written out, and he, he started off by going, okay, we got a real pressure cooker going here. <laughs> Two on, nine, bottom of the ninth. I said, no, no, F Phil, one second. You got, it's got to be more urgent and fast. Urgent, fast. Well, I don't know. What kind of game is this? I said, well, I'm thinking this is a real method actor all of a sudden. <laughs> So I got to give backstory. I can't believe it. So I said, well, it's, it's, it's a Red Sox game. Ah, oh, the Red Sox. That's the most 
evil rival. I said, there you go, Phil. Like a Red Sox game. He said, okay. Okay, here we go. Bottom of the ninth. I said, no, 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 Phil. He said, well, you got to tell me more. He said, it's the playoff game, the, the championship playoff game, bottom of the ninth. Championship playoff game. And then he finally got it. And that also, I was showing up time cards to show him how little time he had. So with some splicing when we got it. But it was for us a thrill. And we ended up going to Yankee Stadium and uh, presenting the Yankees with a platinum record and uh, a platinum record for Steinbrenner and for. Uh, I, all I remember is that Meatloaf was talking to Reggie Jackson in the uh, locker rooms, and he totally was hogging the conversation. I had no part in it, so I sort of wandered in over and kind of nodded to Meatloaf like, hey, he said, oh, yeah, this is Jim Stein, and he wrote everything to, <coughs> to Reggie. And trying to be funny, which is a mistake, I said, so, you play ball around here? <laughs> and uh, Reggie said, yeah, I play ball around here. He didn't laugh. It wasn't, he didn't get any joke in it. And then he said, um, well, I make records. And he says, oh, yeah? I break records. <laughs> I figured I better shut up. <laughs> and then uh, when Meat was talking to Reggie, it was fascinating. I just listened in, and all Reggie was talking about was business. It was like, um, how do they pay you? Every album? Uh, what do they do about discounts? What about the record clubs? Uh, a long list of things about business. That was basically his interest, and uh, Mead got along great with him. That was my my encounter with Reggie Jackson and Phil Rizzuto. And it got time, we had to give the Yankee team a platinum record and uh, they asked us in the dugout <coughs> who do you want to give it to <coughs> and I said Reggie they said no forget it and I said okay I said who else I said Bucky Dent he said oh no problem Bucky and Bucky came running like a bat out of hell you know <laughs> and he was so excited and it was great to meet Bucky Dent he was my favorite Yankee anyway um so that was kind of thrilling because baseball is my great love too, and um, my only love was the sport. It's the one I worship, and the most musical of sports to me is incredibly musical. I don't know how many people are many people baseball fans here. Oh, that's that's that's. Uh, does anyone else find it to be very musical? Uh, I mean, what what's thrilling to me when I say musical is that. It's like Martha Graham in that it's all about tension release. You have the tension of the batter and everyone's in the field. And it's just a moment of stillness. And the minute he hits the ball, it's a convulsion of energy that permeates the whole field with the movement and everything. And to me, that was a ballet. It was like thrilling, the dynamics of baseball. And wonderful. Very different than football, which I don't like as much, mainly. Um, no, that's that one. Uh, any other thoughts? Hmm? I think we have time for one, one more. Yeah? Why, you, you mentioned your parents and you mentioned your mom and dad. Can you talk just a little bit about how you were brought up? Um, <laughs> this is, again, I have to look at that binder of reality and... I have to search for that. Uh, I was brought up in uh, Hewlett, Long Island. Um, well, the best thing is that my mother took me to all those shows off Broadway. That's what really stayed with me. And um, <clears throat> uh, I picked up a opera by myself, really. And I just got it. I was about seven years old. I was getting... In well, <clears throat> I woke up for a baseball game, Little League, and uh, I turned on the radio, and there was the station. I had no idea what it was. There was something playing. I didn't no idea what it was playing, but it was mesmerizing. At seven years old, I was I couldn't. I was so mesmerized that I stayed in bed for fifteen hours. It was the ring cycle, 
that being broadcast on WBAI in New York. And I was just enthralled by the ring cycle. I had no idea what was going on. But it, still to this day, it's to me the greatest thing ever created in music and in theater. And uh, that was my first experience with it as a child. So I had no preconceptions or no thoughts at all. I just experienced it. And uh, it was wonderful. And so that I really owe my parents that for that gift of taking me and exposing me to those Beckett and Albie and I did the opera but uh, otherwise a pretty conventional suburban life except I was nobody really I really wasn't anybody I, I say that not glibly um, I had no persona I didn't know who I was until I did that article it was there were trends but until I did that article, I really that's when I feel I was born in '68, and um, from then on, it's what happened. Anything else? <laughs>